So if you can find both of those, Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 5. And um, if you find your way there, we'll introduce our message this evening. I kind of wanted to preach this evening on that guy, I can't ever remember his name. Not, not Archippus, but uh, Aristarchus. But I figured I wouldn't be able to remember his name, so I just gave it up. Are you there? Any Colossians? Chapter 3? Alright, I want to read, uh, I want to read <coughs> verses... 1 and 2, and uh, then uh, verses 14 through 16. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And then <coughs> verse uh, verse. Let's go to let's let's read twelve through sixteen. That'll be better. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ <coughs> forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Father, please help us this evening as we look specifically at the matter of letting God's Word dwell richly in us. And I pray that you would just impress us, impress us with the simplicity of truth, but also the importance of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's really interesting when you uh, look at the matter of songs or singing in the Bible. And I've been a little bit on this because... I've been burdened about our ministry, and particularly our worship services, that we would be very, very much what God intends the church to be. And so uh, something I have desired for the last couple of years is just for, uh, for us to have spirit-filled services, not uh, emotion-generating services. You can, with atmosphere, you can generate... Uh, a little bit of emotion. That's completely possible by atmosphere. And I've actually watched, uh, I've watched some church services and, and just looked at the, uh, and, and I, this is not, I'm not speaking this critically, I'm just, I guess, speaking as factually as I can. Looked at the um, artificial generating aspects of the service. In other words, just the atmosphere, the setting of a service. Now, I think that uh, I think that setting and atmosphere is important, don't you? In other words, I'm not, I'm not diminishing uh, the importance of the right atmosphere. In other words, if we had a big screen up here behind me tonight, <laughs> and it worked, and <laughs> the, a game were on it, if you, if you people are interested in games, or if, um, I don't know, a cooking show were on it, if you're interested in cooking show or whatever, if, you, if we had screens in here all around and there were shows on and the volume you know not muted but turned down low so that you know I'm louder than them but they're going on and if we had uh, not a set time for our service to begin or end and if, if people just kind of came in randomly and everything just kind of happened you know based on you know uh, the leading if you will or lack of leading uh, of the, the way every individual is led individually. And there are no real order to the service. Uh, I, I get bothered by order of service sometimes, don't you? It's like they always start with a song. They always open with prayer. They always 
give announcements. They always say this or do this or whatever. And, you know, a little bit of orderliness can come become ritualistic sometimes, you know. And, and that, I'm not really, you know, I, I want to be careful about that. But to a degree, orderliness helps to be able to uh, facilitate what you came for to happen, right? In other words, there's just an appropriate atmosphere for preaching. Uh, this hasn't happened in quite a long time, but we used to have people, and when we had a drinking fountain in our original facility, we'd have people just get up right in the middle of the preaching service, and we only had two rows because of how narrow it was there, and they would just like walk right in front of everybody, and they would go over, and we had this buffet thing over here, and they would get a cup out of it, or, and then they would go to the drinking fountain and like, you know, it's one of those glug, glug, glug drinking fountains, you know, and they would get water and everybody would be watching them, like, <laughs> getting water. Like, first couple times I'm thinking, well, you know. And the, the folks that did that, it honestly just didn't occur to them that that was a distraction. Uh, this drinking fountain back here, I've thought about putting on a timer, you know, where like a, at exactly 11 o'clock, it uh, the, it's unplugged, and so you can't even kick on the compressor. Can't kick on for the noise back there. And if anybody goes and tries to get water out of it, just you know they hit the button. It doesn't work, you know. Um, and then have it kick back on at the end of the service time. You probably would think that I'm a control freak or a tyrant or something if I did that. But and it hasn't happened in a while. But sometimes I understand if you're coughing or you know you're about to die of dehydration for some reason in the church service. Uh, they, you know, sometimes it might be necessary for somebody to get something to drink, right? But isn't it distracting when someone gets up in the service? In other words, they get up and they go to the bathroom or whatever. Uh, you know, once in a while that sort of thing is necessary, but when it happens all the time, it's distracting. It's just one of those things where it's tough to pay attention. And there he goes again, you know. <laughs> so 30 seconds earlier tonight, didn't know he was going <laughs> to, you know, whatever. You know, and, and those things are distracting elements. So, in the service, you could generate, couldn't you, an atmosphere that is conducive to the preaching of the Word of God, to the working of the Holy Spirit, by simply how you do things, how we conduct ourselves. What I'm talking about is when, you know, ten minutes before the service, you know, the, you know there starts to be, you know, a drum beating get that kind of like, oh, the anticipate, anticipatory drum beat, you know, and then all of a sudden the smoke machines turn on, you know, and uh, then uh, the lights dim and, and, you know, and they're creating an atmosphere <coughs> and then, you know, the worship leader comes out and uh, I'm wearing the wrong jacket. I would imitate a worship leader, but I can't do it in this jacket. I'm very sorry tonight uh, but he comes out and he does his thing and and uh, there's almost like a rhythm to the speaking and uh, you know there's background music while the guy talks and I've seen this in Baptist churches where during the invitation there's just a you know uh, the pianist I've, we even had it where we've had people here and they're like oh nobody's jumped up and playing rhythmic music while the pastor's talking you know uh, <laughs> there are some churches that play like ball game organ music you know, and, and uh, they uh, do that sort of thing. It's, and it's, it's for added effect or background. And what they're trying to produce is an atmosphere. And succeeding or failing at it to different degrees, I guess. We don't need that. We need the Holy Spirit of God to create our atmosphere. In other words, our atmosphere needs to be... I'm not against some of a lot of what I just mentioned. But there needs to be a real genuine meeting with God in the church house. And uh, it's interesting to me, music is probably in most people's minds the most important aspect of the worship service. Would anyone, I, you, it may not be for you, but would anybody disagree with that? In other words, when people think of the worship service, they think usually, normally, more about 
the music and the style of the music and the presentation of the music and, and the, how much of it there is, then they do pretty much the rest of the service. Now granted, most of the people here this evening, I think, came because you're more interested in the preaching of the Word of God. In other words, if you were to just balance and say, which would I be more interested in? We could cut the music and uh, have the preaching, and you could probably still go home and be okay with it. But if we cut the preaching and just had the music, you'd probably feel a little bit left out or disappointed this evening. And so granted, that probably wouldn't be here. There's a lot of mention in the Bible about music, though. The Bible talks a lot about music, but it's interesting, really fascinating, that in the New Testament, there are only two passages of Scripture that give any kind of commands about music or about singing. And that's interesting to me. The Old Testament has a lot to say about music, has a lot to say about uh, individuals and the way that they use music, and it has a lot to report on music, but it's interesting to me that in the New Testament of the Scripture, uh, song, singing, sang, sung, the deriv derivatives of actual singing, uh, there are fewer than ten total references. Uh, one of those, a couple of them, you, you would probably think of instantly in the, for instance, in Revelation where they sang a new song. Uh, in, uh, after Jesus, uh, after the Lord's Supper, when they went out to the Mount, after they sung in Him, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so it's more historic, it's more historic or in the future, it's more of an accounting of this is what was done than it is uh, this is how to do it. It's not instructional. But the passage of Scripture we're looking at this evening has some instruction in it. And let me just address the what I would say the very limited snapshot in the New Testament about music. There are a couple of things in the New Testament that I hear people say, well, the Bible doesn't really say much about this, and so, uh, you know, it's not for the church. One of them's tithing. Anybody heard of the tithing one? Uh, you know, uh, and by the way, I'm on that. I'm on that bandwagon, kind of, just a little bit. Uh, in other words, tithing is not commanded in the New Testament, nor is it abolished in the New Testament either. So, in other words, I've heard people say, you know, you should give to the church, you know, because the tithe is supposed to go to the temple, and you know, the requirement to tithe is not a New Testament law type of command. And I would say, yes, I, I agree with that. I, I think the same is also true. It was, though, a well-established, it was well-established in the Old Testament of the Scripture. In other words, there wasn't a lot of new information. When Jesus said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, tithing was part of the law. And Jesus Christ is the fulfilling of the law, and so we are free in that sense from tithing, like we're free from everything else in the law in the same sense. So I would, I would fall into the camp of an individual that would say that all Scripture is profitable and uh, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness, and uh, the idea that uh, <clears throat> we don't owe God anything is fallacious. Uh, not only that, but Jesus commanded the Pharisees. One thing Jesus said the Pharisees did well was their tithing. And so what I'm saying about that is if I'm going to teach tithing, I don't very much. Actually, I might ought to a little bit more, but I teach more giving than tithing. In other words, in the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul in several instances wrote to several churches about giving and the way to give, and he taught grace giving. Uh, he used the example of uh, the church at Thessalonica, the church at Macedonia, and he even told them, you know, how to give on the first day of the week. Let every man lay by him in store according as the Lord hath prospered him. They were not giving for the support of the Levites or for the support of the temple. But they were giving, the collection was for the ministering to the saints. So it's for the ministry, for doing the work of the ministry. And practically speaking, in the first century church, ministry cost money. And practically speaking, in the 21st century, I always get confused, 20th, 21st. I feel like we're in 2000, it should be 20th. But uh, we were in the 20s when I was in the 1900s. I was confused then. I'm going to stay confused. So 21st century, you know, money is still uh, something that the church uses. We don't have to have this building, do we? No. We don't have to have a bank account, do we? No. But is it easier to do ministry with the building and the bank account? Yes. Or is, are there some things we could do this evening more easily, especially actually in a somewhat hostile 
uh, in a somewhat hostile area. In other words, if we didn't have our own building, we found when we tried to start our church that to try to meet in a public place, there the the powers that be were very hostile to a church meeting in a in a school or a public park or in any place uh, that you had to have permission to be there. We found that the answer was no, and we didn't want to go through the legal, you know, to force that. And so it's nice to be able to have this place. And I like the air conditioning. And I like the atmosphere. In other words, it's 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 conducive. We've seen a lot of people saved in this place, and it's been good. And so uh, it's nice to have. It's also nice to be able to do ministry, to do things for the ministry. Uh, we have a church bus, and it isn't just because we enjoy possessing church buses, it's because we pick up kids with the church bus. I mean, honestly, we use it for doing the ministry, and, and we don't have to have a bus, but there are things we can do because we have one. So anyway, I don't want to get off in the distraction, but there are people that say, well, tithing's not taught in the New Testament, or giving's not taught in the New Testament. I have some angry Facebook friends who posts all the time about uh, yeah, about how the churches are all about money and you shouldn't ever give money to a church. And uh, I get a kick out of it, to be quite honest with you, uh, because they're, they're just angry about something. They're bitter about something, and so they're imbalanced about it. On the other hand, I don't like to go to church and feel like they're trying to get my money. I feel like you know the reason you're there is, is so they can get your money. And, and, and sadly in all kinds of churches that, that you kind of can get that feeling or impression. So anyway, that's one. The other one's music. In other words, the New Testament is not full of commands about music. Now the Old Testament is full of examples of music. But actually in the Scripture, we know that part of worship in the temple and so forth was, uh, was using music, was using musical instruments. And part of worship was, uh, or part of praise was music, and we certainly know that when uh, that that singing was important. We know uh, <clears throat> that there was very, very high quality music in the days of Israel. For instance, uh, learn a little bit of Hebrew sometime and read Psalms. Read, learn a little bit of Hebrew and just try to read the Psalms, and you'll see it's the most brilliant poetry in the world. There's nothing like psalms for just amazing literature. The literary value of psalms is acknowledged by God-haters uh, because it's just, it is. I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful the way the psalms are put together and uh, the, the style and the poetry and the prose is incredible. And so the psalms were also intended to be sung and uh, written to music. I wish, I mean, so, anytime I read the Psalms, I oftentimes think, I wish I could hear this. I wish I could hear this the way that it was written. In other words, uh, when it was read, it would have been sung. And I oftentimes wish I had the original music. I've been in churches where uh, pretty much they've set every Psalm to song. And uh, I've enjoyed that in some places, and I've not enjoyed it in some places too. So depending on what church it was and how they sung it. Uh, but there's a lot of history about singing, but there's not a lot of command. But here we are in Colossians chapter 3 this evening. There are two instances in the New Testament where singing is specifically mentioned. And <clears throat> it's mentioned in the context uh, of a series of commands that begin by telling us to seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of the throne of God. And <clears throat> we're still in that context where there's a string of commands about how to live in light of the fact that we're, we're risen with Jesus, that we're alive. And truly, having a song in your heart is a result of being alive. And I'm not talking about physically being alive. I'm talking about being alive spiritually. But when you're in fellowship with God, there's a song that goes with it. When you are... Uh, communing with God, there is. There's a song that is in your heart. And you might be one of these people. I enjoy the song maker uppers. Usually they don't do it much after they're adults. But kids, you ever met a kid they will just sing about anything? I'm going to go to the room and I'm going to throw out the trash and I'm going to die and I'm going to die and I'm so happy. And like a little, the little kid singer, you know. I love the little kid. How many of y'all had little kid singers and made up songs? Yeah, Jackie, you did. Melissa, you had a kid that made a song. Anthony does right all the time. So, uh, anyway, 
uh, <coughs> you know, I just, they just, just got a song and they just get to sing whatever. I'm just going to sing it. And it got that joy in them. And if you know Jesus as your Savior, there is a song. And there's a distinct song. It's, it's a type of a song that's in your heart. But verse 15, the Bible says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. By the way, uh, was it Byron Fox that set that to song? And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Anyway, I don't know how, it, I messed it up, but he, it, it didn't work very well in his rendition either. But uh, anyway, they sing, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Anyway, when I read that, I hear the song. And so, this is a command. In, in other words, when the Scripture says, and let, it is, not a, it is not in the grammatical construction where it is saying, this is something you may wish to do. This is something that if you're risen with Jesus Christ, you are to do. You are commanded to do. And by the way, it's a litmus test. You ever felt like, I don't want to sing? Huh? Here's, I don't want to sing. I don't feel like singing. Well, because something isn't right. I don't want to sing a song. Now, some people say, well, Pastor, if you heard me sing, listen, uh, you sound good to yourself when you sing. That's all that matters, right? Uh, and anybody sounds good in the shower. I've always heard that. But I don't want to sing. Well, sing in the shower or sing to yourself. But <clears throat> the reality of it is that there's something about having God's peace which makes one want to sing, and it's a litmus test. And then the Bible says there's a unity in singing. Look at this. Let there... Peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body. In other words, we're called to have God's peace. And it is a unified thing. It's something that draws and brings people together. This isn't universally true, but it's pretty true. If you're sitting here and facing there, you can really tell who's doing well and who isn't during the song service. I, again, it's not universally true. Sometimes there are reasons why uh, somebody's not singing. Uh, I lost my voice last month, and I just, man, I just had this cough that would never go away, and I, I had to go in the back room during the singing because it's hard not to sing. And I couldn't sing. You watch me, you've seen me kind of <laughs> break out into song, and it's hard not to sing. So I just go in the back room, and then I'm back there singing. I'm like, I can't sing. i got, I got to preach in a few minutes, and I can't be singing in the song service. But if you're up here and you look out there and you see folks that won't sing, now some folks are just bashful, or they're embarrassed, or they're, uh, they haven't gotten over themselves. They're self-conscious. They uh, think that people are watching them and, uh, or listening to them. They're afraid they'll uh, not sing right, or they don't know the song, or it's new, or whatever. They're, again, it's not universally true. But there is something which draws believers together and being called together, and it begins with the peace of God in our hearts. In other words, the song comes from the inner peace. You may be a performer, but, and you may be able to sing no matter what. In other words, there are individuals who can perform, right? They just, they're talented, and they can act. And they can get on the platform, and they can act like everything's good, and they can sing beautifully, and it'll touch people but it's a performance because it isn't actually coming from the heart. That's a possibility as well. Now look at verse 16. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, <clears throat> there are a lot of important words in this verse. Uh, there are a lot of important phrases in our saying, Word of Christ. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. What is the Word of Christ? It's the Scripture. It's the Word of God. It's specifically... You know, when Jesus told His disciples with the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It's the things that Jesus commanded, right? The Word of Christ. And let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly <clears throat> rich gives the idea of abundance, doesn't it? You know, uh, you have a piece of cake, or a piece of, let's, let's do cheesecake. So 
it's easier for cheesecake to be rich. You ever had rich cheesecake? Yeah, Anthony has. He's got, where'd you have it at, Anthony? What's the richest cheesecake you ever had? The original cheesecake at the Cheesecake Factory? Okay, so the original cheesecake at the Cheesecake Factory, Anthony says, is rich. And sometimes I've had like chocolate cheesecake, and I mean, it's just too chocolate. <laughs> it's got lots of chocolate in it. And like, wow, that's really rich. And so I can only eat a little sliver of it because, I mean, just so much sugar, so much chocolate. It's just a lot. Richly. That's what I think of, okay? I'm sorry, but my mind, when I think of how does Word of God dwell in you richly, I'm talking about just loaded. You know, just a lot of it. Uh, let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Now, how do you get loaded up with the Word of God? Read it every day. Yeah, well, how did Joshua say to do it? Now, Moses told Joshua, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but that thou shalt meditate therein day and night. So how do we get it so that it's in us? Well, meditate in it. Get in it. You know, there is no excuse in the day and age in which we live for a person not to have the Word of God in them richly. That really is the truth. You say, Pastor, people are busier than they ever were before. Yeah, but I'm just telling you, man, audio? <laughs> it is so easy, isn't it, to not even turn it on, but when you get in your car, it turns itself on. It's so easy to have it playing on your phone. Uh, <clears throat> listen, if it's that important, it shouldn't be a problem to get up and get in it. Or before you go to bed, to finish on it. It's just a key to personal peace in your life. If you learn to just meditate on spiritual things, the last thing you do in the day, just meditate on the Word of God, the last thing you do. Just hear spiritual things and meditate on spiritual. It's just amazing how different your rest is if you do that. And we're supposed to let the Word of God dwell in us richly. And then, here's the manner in which what will happen. If you're letting the Word of God dwell in you richly, you'll be a teacher. Teaching and admonishing one another. Now, the word admonish here is the word that we use for counseling. It's new fa Oh, it's a, uh, <clears throat> the word that really has to do with giving counsel to one another. So, we would teach each other and admonish each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, we know what the psalms are. Man, they're good. So you can read psalms every single day and be helped every single day by them. They're just a real help. And, man, if you can sing them you know, and have them in your heart, might be some people that overhear them and be affected by them. But we as believers are supposed to have God's peace. We're supposed to be called to it. We're supposed to be thankful. And then <clears throat> the Bible says that we teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now grace carries it with the idea of power. Power. Carries with the idea of ability. I, God's ability in every there are a lot of contexts for grace many contexts for grace but in every instance grace is outside ability and the Bible says we're supposed to sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord to the Lord you know a lot of times our songs are not to the Lord as much as they are to people. <clears throat> I listened to a couple of uh, <laughs> pop songs yesterday. I tried to. I have a hard time with because of my hearing. and prob I don't know. I just have a hard time a lot of times picking up what the words are. I have to like rewind, listen, rewind, listen, rewind, listen, and so forth. And you know, the, the pop songs I listened to universally talked about the person singing. I, 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 and I'm going to, and I think, and, and if it's you, it's you with me, you know, uh, do you love me, whatever, I, I, you, you, I, I, but it's all about me. It's really inward focused. It is a representation. And by the way, uh, I've always felt, not always, but uh, I, 
I feel that it's really a sham. It's really a scam for people to try to emulate someone else's music. In other words, most people that have their music and it's so important to them, it's not even their own music. They didn't write it and they didn't sing it. But it's their, it's their music and it's like, this is my music. Man. You ever heard, my music, man? It's my music. And most of the time when people sing their music or listen to their music, it's not even their music, it's someone else's. Someone else's life. And they even have to emulate behaviors of the other person just so that the music becomes theirs. If it's your music in that sense, then to, for that to become your music, you have to become that person. And you just really become an imitator of somebody that really is not worth imitating for the most part. You read, listen to what the, the songs are about. I, I'm not up on all the pop music, but I try to listen to some. And uh, songs are about the failures of people and failure in a way that God doesn't want in the life of a believer. How about uh, Miley Cyrus? What are her songs about? Oops. I did it again. Let's make that personal. You know, let's make it our music. You'll have some pretty major failure in your life. You know, uh, what's the, the I'm a wrecking ball? Is that the one that everybody makes all the spoofs on? Whatever it is. I, I'm not, it's not my music. But I'm just telling you, if, you, if that's going to be your music, you're going to have to be a wreck. Seriously. I mean, if you're going to emulate it, it really, <laughs> I'm, I'm oversimplifying how I'm stating it, but it's the truth. And if, it's good, if you're going to personalize the world's music, then you're going to have to be like the world. And that's the polar opposite of what a believer is supposed to be like when they sing with grace in their heart to the Lord. Redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercies. His child and forever I am. Redeemed. Redeemed. It's a song that comes to my heart. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you what, those songs are about redemption, aren't they? They're songs about, I was this, but I'm not anymore. Yeah. Listen, you may be able to relate to somebody's sadness or their sorrow, but it doesn't pick anybody up and take them from where they are to the place where God wants to bring them. And the psalms and the hymns and the spiritual songs do that. And the Bible says that we are to sing grace with grace in our hearts to the Lord. Let's finish up. Let's just go over to Ephesians chapter 5. There's another mention here, and it's, it's coupled with the command to be uh, followers of God. Go to Ephesians <coughs> chapter 5 and uh, verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise. A person walking circumspectly is looking around so that he doesn't stumble or fall into a trap. He's looking around. He's aware of his environment or his circumstances. So see then you should walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, uh, <coughs> redeeming the time because the days are evil. And the word evil here is, uh, it is the way that you understand the word, but it also is an eminence concept. It means it's it's coming soon. It's short. It's the evil day is is coming or the, the the days are this way. Don't have much time. So redeem what you have. Get it get something for it. Wherefore? Okay, so this is how to do it. Be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine where in a success, but be filled with the Spirit. Here's a key to spiritual victory. Instead of being controlled by something, be controlled by God's Spirit. And here's another key to spiritual victory. If you're controlled by something, you're not controlled by God's Spirit. And we are to be Spirit-filled, Spirit-controlled, spiritual. How do we do that? Well, the same way that we let the Word of God dwell in us richly is a real key to the beginning of that. 
get in God's Word and get it in you so that it's overflowing. It's flowing abundantly out of you. And then the Bible says in verse 18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Let's make one last application here tonight. Where is the song of the Christian directed? Huh? With grace in your hearts to the Lord. Singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to the Lord. You ever done something nice for somebody uh, and you, you wanted it to be all about them? You know, in a relationship, it ought to be that way, right? Sometimes my wife, this has been tough on her in our marriage. I like so many things that I'm never the same. Like, she would like to make my favorite meal, but I don't have one. Like, I have favorite meals. And uh, when we first got married, man, she tried and tried and tried. Like, I want to find something that's going to be his favorite meal. She tried all kinds of things. I mean, I liked them all. You know, but none of them were really my favorite because I like everything. I just like a lot of stuff. And sometimes I want seafood. Sometimes I want steak. Sometimes I want salad. I know I shouldn't have said that. Some of y'all judge me. But... <laughs> the reality of it is that when we want to do something for one another, we want to make it special for the other person, not for ourselves, right? Now, <clears throat> I've never gone to Joanne Fabrics for my wife. But if I ever did, it would be a token of it being all about her. In other words, if I ever went to Joanne... I, we've been in Joanne Fabrics together since marriage, haven't we? Years ago. I think we have. I'm pretty sure. And I think I went and sat in the car. <laughs> in the of it. Um, I'll tell you something I do that's not for me. When the coupons for Joanne Fabrics come in the mail, I don't throw them away. <laughs> it really, I mean, honestly, I think when I see Joanne Fabrics, I, I have memories of my childhood invoked of fabric stores, and I just instantly just want to chew it up and swallow it or throw it in the trash or destroy it somehow. You know, get, light a fire or whatever. <laughs> but I put the Joanne Fabrics... Uh, flyer on her desk. I don't care if she spends money there. I just hate the place personally. Right? So if we ever go to Joanne Fabrics, it's all about her. It's not about me. There are things that she does with me um, that are just things that I enjoy. She will not go to Chuckalusky with me. I've been trying to first. She keeps saying, where should we go on a special? we got a day. I'm like, well, let's, let's drive down to Everglades City and let's go to Chuckalusky and look around. She's like, the place is full of mosquitoes and there's it's off the beaten path and there's nothing there. Why do you want to go there? She's never even been there. But uh, if she ever goes to Chukalusky, it'll be because of me. Because she wants to do something with me, for me. And you know, I can enjoy things that she enjoys and she can enjoy things that I enjoy. But the point of it is if I'm doing something for her, it really doesn't matter whether... I enjoy it or not. That's not the point. It's for her. And if she does something for me, then it doesn't really matter. If it's for me, to her it doesn't matter whether it's for her or not. Because it's for me. And if we're singing to the Lord, it really isn't about us. And so I think there are some standards in the Scripture. In other words, I know people that pick their church over the style of music. Pick their church over their style of music. To me, that's just a fallacy. That's just bad thinking. It's not for the Lord. That's for you. That's your music. That's your style. That's what you want. And it isn't about God. It's about you. <clears throat> we all, I guess, are guilty of getting somebody something that we want. I joked about little Ben Wielander some years ago. When he was four years old, on my birthday, he bought me a birthday present. Went to the toy uh, section. I think it was Walmart he got it, but he got me a WWE wrestling belt. 
And I started to pick it up, and he took it. Put it on. It didn't fit me anyway, he said. And then when they left, it went home with him. That was very nice of him to pick something out for me for my birthday. <laughs> it really wasn't about me at all, was it? And you know something? If we're singing to the Lord, I think we ought to be conscious of whether or not it actually is to the Lord. Shouldn't we? Yes. In other words, it ought to be very, very carefully evaluated. Now the question asks, does God like this? Is this what God requires? Is this what God asked for? Is this what He wants? And that's the believer's song. It's a song to the Lord. And it's for the Lord. And we ought to be confident when we sing it. We ought to know God well enough to know He likes it. <clears throat> you ever had somebody get you something and they, they thought you liked it? You ever eat a meal or you here, have some more. <laughs> oh, you liked it so much last time I made it again. <laughs> Casserole, right? <laughs> We do that to God with music. A lot of people do that to God with music. Now, you can do it to God with music a couple of ways. First of all, if you're singing and you're not singing to the Lord. In other words, you can sing some, some great songs that I think this, this hymn book just has some really fantastic songs in it. But you can sing those songs and just be singing the melody. And you're not thinking about the Lord. You're not thinking about what you're singing. And it's not to the Lord. It's just to the forest or something. And you could be singing a song to the Lord and it could be that God says, I don't want that. I don't like that. God has taste and preference, you know. It's based on the fact that He's holy. You know, a lot of what's done in the name of singing is not holy. You watch what a lot of music does to the bodies of the singers. The tone and the voice of the singers. It's too sensual to be holy. It's just, it just can't be holy and make that kind of an act or reaction in the singer and in the listener. Some songs that I've listened to are just downright irreverent or doctrinally wrong. They're not full of the Word of God. In other words, the Word of God's not dwelling richly in it because they, it contradicts the Word of God. It may express what the author feels about God, but it isn't who God is, and it isn't holy, and it isn't a song to the Lord. And I think that all of us kind of... we, we stray somewhat in both those areas. You sing a song and you don't know whether it's sound doctrinally. It's probably not to the Lord because it's not coming out of the Word of God that's dwelling in you. You sing a song that's something that you know or that, that God doesn't want. It's not to the Lord. It's your music, not God's music. Now I have to say, there's a lot I could say about music style and presentation and different things. But you have to have a heart to receive it to begin with because it's really a personal matter for people. It's so personal that the uh, first person possessive pronoun is used. My music. Biblically speaking, if ye then be risen with Christ, ye are His child. And when you sing a song, if you belong to Him, whose song is it? His music. What's His music like? I think it's something that we need to dive into a little bit and ask the questions and analyze and answer the questions on the basis of the Word of God dwelling in us. An unspiritual person does not have a spiritual song. A spiritual song comes from the Spirit of God. And that's where we get the grace in our hearts to the Lord. There's a lot there. There's a lot more there than what we covered tonight, but I want to bring it up. 
because I think it's important for us to be deliberate in praising the Lord with songs and hymns and spiritual songs. Father, thank you. Thank you for the word and for what we've heard tonight. God, I feel so inadequate sometimes. This is one of those times. And I just pray that, Lord, you would just impress us with the truth and help us to apply it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.